In the last video, we saw that traffic can be classified and marked, but there's not much point to that unless we use this information in some useful way. So we need to take action on our traffic. Throughout this video, we're going to see how we can use these markings and the actions we can take for each traffic class. In the last video, we were classifying traffic based on their requirements and marking packets so we can share these classifications. When we classify traffic, we're putting the traffic into classes. We have a few different classes available to use and several drop probabilities within each class. That means that we don't have a class for each application. Rather, the class groups applications by similar traffic requirements. Packets are normally classified as they enter a router. If the packet already has markings, this makes classification easier. If there's no marking, or if the router chooses to ignore the markings, the packet may still be classified based on things like source or destination IP address, port, protocol, that sort of thing. If the router wants to mark the packet, this would typically be done after classification, but before the packet is sent out. Remember that quality of service is locally significant, meaning that each router or switch needs to make its own decisions on how a packet is handled. This is called per hop behavior or PHB. Once the classification is complete, the next step is queuing. Each interface will have several queues. These are usually implemented in hardware, but there could be software queues as well. Some routers or switches may have four queues per interface. Others may have eight. We're showing four to keep it simple. When packets are ready to be sent out, they are added to one of these queues based on its classification. When the interface is available, the packet is moved from the queue and is sent out the interface. There will be many packets coming into a router, but a single interface can only put one packet on the wire at a time. So when there are multiple packets spread among different queues, how does the router decide which packet to send next? This is handled by a component called the scheduler. The scheduler looks at the priority of each queue and will decide which queue to service next. And that gets to the heart of how QoS prioritizes traffic. The scheduler will service a high priority queue more often than it will service a low priority queue. The question is, can we adjust the amount of priority a scheduler gives to each queue? Of course we can. Consider this example, which would suit a four class model very well. This allocates a third of the interface's bandwidth to real time traffic. Best effort gets a quarter and scavenger gets only 5%. Why does the best effort class get so much bandwidth? Because it's the default class, meaning a lot of traffic will end up here. Now hang on. Is that a typo? Why is there nothing listed next to the critical class? Well, I'm glad you asked. The percentages shown here are limits. That means in times of congestion, these queues will not be allowed any more than the limits shown here. The critical class is not given a specific limit. So you might assume that it has the remaining 37%, but that's not true. Imagine your link is congested and real-time traffic is using 5% of the link, even though it's allowed to use more. The critical class can now make use of these unallocated resources. So that means that it can take advantage of these resources before the other classes do. If we set a limit on this class, that simply wouldn't happen. If you're moving to a more complicated model, you can divide your categories up, like in this example. This is just the same as the last example, but it's divided up further. Keep in mind these are just examples and you can tune these as needed. So you might have noticed that it's common for an interface to have eight queues, which is great because that lines up really well with our eight classes. So when does the drop probability come into it? You'll remember from the last video that this is a bit like a subclass within a class. Let's think of our queues again. Imagine a lot of one type of traffic arrives at the router. These packets are classified and added to a queue. If the ingress interface is much faster than the egress interface, these packets might even fill the entire queue. If a queue is full and more packets come in, what's gonna happen? Without any special handling, this packet will get dropped. And this is called a tail drop, as it's dropped from the tail of the queue. 
Now, this is where drop probability comes in. Drop probability can be set to low, medium, or high. When the queue fills up, the packets with the high drop probability are dropped first, which makes room in the queue. If there are no high probability packets, medium probability packets are dropped. In this way, we can still prioritize one type of traffic over another within a single queue. So far, we've been talking about using QoS when the link is congested. That is, when a link is full, using QoS to decide which traffic is forwarded and which traffic is dropped. That's great, of course, but there are other QoS tools available to us. The first is policing, also known as rate limiting. This is where we define a limit on how much bandwidth certain traffic can have. This could be a type of traffic like FTP downloads, traffic between two particular IP addresses, or some other combination of conditions. First, think about the traffic we've identified. As shown here, it's common for traffic to increase and decrease over time. This is shown by the high peaks in the graph. When we configure policing, we're setting a hard limit. That is, a limit to the amount of bandwidth that this traffic can have, as shown by this line. Any amount of traffic under this limit is said to be conforming. Anything above this limit is said to be non-conforming. The whole point of the policer is to take action on any non-conforming packets. The simplest and probably most common action is to drop all non-conforming packets. This strictly enforces the rate limit and would change our traffic pattern to look more like this. Another option is to remark non-conforming packets rather than dropping them. Maybe we could raise the drop probability or move them into an entirely different class. This might be useful if we'd rather an upstream device decide which packets are dropped and which are forwarded. Now, here's where things might get a little confusing. A policer can recognize a small and short burst in traffic that goes over the limit. In a case like this, the policer will not consider this burst to be non-conforming and will not take any additional action. However, a large increase of traffic, or traffic that is over the limit for an extended duration, is not considered a burst, and therefore is still non-conforming. The point of this is that the policer can be a bit friendly and won't penalise your traffics for small infractions. Some traffic types do not respond well to drops. Reclassifying can also be tricky as packets may be sent out of order, which can be very bad for certain types of traffic. The main point I'm trying to make here is that you should understand the effect of policing on your traffic before you apply it. Policing is not the only rate limiting technology. We also have shaping. This is very similar to policing, but it's a bit gentler. We're still looking at traffic that goes over a particular limit, but we don't simply drop or remark a traffic. Instead, when traffic goes over the limit, excess packets are queued. You could also call this buffering. This is where excess packets are stored in the queue until there's bandwidth available to send them. And this works really well when dealing with small bursts of traffic. Instead of just cutting these peaks off, we're really smoothing them out. We're changing the shape of this graph. We're smoothing out bursty traffic. Now for the warnings, if your traffic bursts are too large, your queue will fill up. When the queue is full, no new packets can be accepted and tail drops will occur. Also, once again, not all traffic likes shaping. Shaping delays packets. This is generally not good for things like real-time traffic that really need a consistent and regular delivery of packets. Now you might be wondering, can we use policing and shaping together? Absolutely you can. Consider a link between a service provider and a customer. The ports on the routers may be capable of 1 gig. However, the customer may only be paying for a 100 meg service, so that's all the provider will guarantee. The provider will then use a policer to rate limit the traffic on their port to 100 meg. Anything over that will be dropped. Now, a policer, it's not ideal for a customer, is it? The customer's interface is capable of 1 gig, so their router may try to send traffic out at a rate higher than 100 meg. A lot of this traffic will be dropped by the provider, which as we've said is not good for a lot of traffic types. So the customer could configure a 100 meg shaper on their interface. This will prevent outbound traffic from going over 100 meg while buffering packets as needed. 
This will prevent the provider's policer from kicking in and dropping packets. Let's take a step back and look at congestion again. We've already looked at how we can manage congestion when it occurs, but is there anything we can do to prevent it? Well, we can't prevent congestion entirely, but there are a few things we can do to help alleviate it. We do this with RED and WRED. You do need a bit of TCP background to understand how RED and WRED work. In particular, we're interested in acknowledgements and windowing. When data is sent using TCP, the receiver will send back an acknowledgement. This is to confirm that the data has been received. If the acknowledgement is not received, the original sender assumes the data was lost and will resend it. It's not efficient to send an acknowledgement for every single packet, so TCP uses windowing. The sender and receiver agree on a window size, which is the amount of data that can be sent before an acknowledgement is required. The receiver then sends a single acknowledgement to cover all of this data. The sender will pause and wait for the acknowledgement before sending more data. If the acknowledgement is not received, all the data in that window needs to be resent. Now quite often the window size will start small. As acknowledgements are received, both parties become more confident in the stability of this connection and they will start to grow the window size. If acknowledgements go missing and data needs to be resent, then the window size will start to shrink. This is to minimize the amount of data that needs to be resent over an unreliable connection. The key point is that the smaller the window, the more acknowledgements need to be sent. This means the sender spends more time waiting and less time sending. I think that's enough TCP theory for now. Let's see how red fits into the picture. When a link becomes congested, the buffer begins to fill up. If the buffer is completely full, we will start seeing tail drops. So what red will do is it will randomly select a few packets to be dropped. Yeah, really, red will drop a few packets before the network gets congested in order to help prevent congestion. That sounds crazy. How does that even help? Well, what this does is it prevents the receiver from getting a packet, which means they won't send an acknowledgement. A lost acknowledgement means the window size will shrink. The smaller window size means that acknowledgements will need to be sent more often. In turn, that means the sender will need to pause and wait for acknowledgements more often. The result is that the sender will not send traffic as quickly, which means less congestion. Now, there are two key points with RED. Firstly, RED is not dropping packets all the time. It only starts operating as the link approaches congestion. Second, RED is completely random. It sees every packet as being equal, so any packet can be a target. That might sound a bit aggressive. And you know what? It is. Some traffic is more important than others, so we should be able to discriminate a little bit when we're selecting which packets to drop. For this reason, we have weighted red. This uses class information to target lower priority flows more often than higher priority flows. Keep in mind the high priority traffic isn't completely immune, it's just hit less often. So in practice, we only ever use W red, not red. And now for the warning. We shouldn't use red or W red on UDP traffic. Why? Because it will probably do more harm than good. UDP does not have acknowledgements or window sizes, so dropping UDP traffic won't improve congestion. The sender won't slow down, but we still have missing packets. And that brings us to the end of this introduction to QoS. Of course, there's a lot more to learn, but this solid foundation should make it easier for you to take it from here. I hope you've enjoyed this series. Please let me know what you think.